I'd like to invite um, Dr. Karen Parker and Dr. Antonio Hardin to come up. Um, they're going to be um, illustrating something that we do a lot in academic medicine, which is put basic science, translational science, clinical science, and implementation and population science all together so that you can take an idea, a mechanism, and have a, as immediate impact as possible. And you don't have to wait years. You can really try to implement change right away. So um, Antonio Hardin is the Division Chief of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and a professor in the department, and Karen Parker is an associate professor, runs a, runs a wonderful laboratory. Come on up. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so um, I, we're honored, and I, I'm so thrilled to be sharing the stage here with Antonio. Um, we're going to be telling you, I think we, we do a lot of research together, and so we sort of picked a single thread to be able to illustrate the translational power of bench to bedside, and also hopefully to provide the story of hope for what we're, we're trying to do um, in autism. So autism is a significant public health problem. Over the last 20 years, its prevalence has been rising. And so in the year 2018, one in 59 children are affected by autism. And we spent $268 billion as a nation on this disease. This cost is estimated to rise to $1 trillion by the year 2025. Um, autism is characterized by two core features, which are persistent deficits um, in social um, interactions and communication. Um, so lack of interest in peers, um, lack of eye contact, um, and um, also the presence of restricted repetitive behaviors, so lining up objects, having obsessive interests, head banging, hand flopping. Um, currently, autism is based on, diagnosed on the basis of phenomenology. You've heard a little bit about that today. So signs, symptoms, course of illness. Um, and there are no laboratory-based tests to detect autism. So if you think you're having a heart attack, we bring you to the ER, we measure cardiac enzymes, we EKG you. There isn't the equivalent analog in um, autism yet. And right now, um, the the, the treatment that we have is behavioral therapies, which need to be enacted very early to work maximally, and they can be very really effective depending on the child, and this can be costly depending on where you live. Um, right now, there's two FDA-approved drugs to treat autism, which are two antipsychotics. They treat um, associated features such as irritability, um, but not the core features of the disease. So we don't have a single drug yet approved to treat these core features. And um, some of the reasons for the lack of a laboratory-based diagnostic to detect autism and effective drugs to treat its core features are because autism's disease biology is currently poorly understood. So um, this is partly because um, the organ of interest is the brain. And so unlike cancer, we don't pull out the tumor and do profiling on the cells. We've also spent a lot of our time looking in blood, which may not be the best matrix to diagnose a brain disease, but something like cerebral spinal fluid, which has been effective in other neurological conditions, is um, extremely difficult to obtain. Um, and right now, we have a bunch of animal models, some that have generated um, really important findings. But for the things that we care about for this particular disease, complex, um, sophisticated social cognition and vision as the primary modality of the species are simply lacking in the control animals of the existing models. And so a biological way to detect autism would enable earlier diagnoses. So we know that children at familial risk for autism, if we um, were able to detect autism very early, um, can gain up to 15 IQ points. And if we detect it early, we reduce the lifetime cost of care by 67%. We know that if there was a biological and easy way to detect autism, um, this would reduce time to treatment. Um, we would have improved diagnostic yield of autism tests. And we would have identification of druggable targets for therapeutic intervention. So how do we bridge the bench to bedside divide? And that's what this talk is about. And so um, about 10 years ago now, Antonio and I met up. And so my background is, is as a basic social neuroscientist, I'm also a primatologist. Um, and Antonio, as Laura mentioned, is a child psychiatrist. And he's, been, um, he's one of the world's experts in um, autism neurobiology, as well as treatment trials in autism. And so we teamed up and sort of said, how are we going to be able to address this huge significant problem? And so here's our translational roadmap. 
We, built, um, we developed a sophisticated animal model to identify biomarkers and targets for treatment. We then put this into patients and asked, is the biology shared with these monkeys that have naturally occurring social impairments? And then Antonio will take the baton and tell you about our first in human study of a drug that's treating social abilities in kids with autism. So if we think about how do we model autism in a monkey, um, we know in the human, um, general human population, autism traits are generally distributed. And um, at the California National Primate Research Center, where I'm also an affiliate scientist, there are 5,500 rhesus monkeys. And in monkeys that are at the extremes of this distribution, um, these low social monkeys initiate and receive fewer affiliative interactions. They spend less time grooming and playing. They display more inappropriate social behaviors. Um, they have diminished social interest and less social competence. And on a um, sort of gold standard scale that we've reversed engineered for monkeys, they have more of these autistic traits on something called the social responsiveness scale. And so what my lab did was um, we created a high throughput um, statistical classification algorithm to identify monkeys at the extremes of this population. And we've been studying them. And so what we found is that these monkeys have face recognition deficits, um, that they have diminished social competence. So that monkey down below is a screenshot of a, an aggressive monkey. And so almost any primate would gaze over it. The low social monkeys don't. They fail to make affiliative overtures when they see videos of monkeys trying to affiliate with them. Um, they fail on joint attention tasks. Um, they don't pay with juice if we ask them, do you want to see a social video? Um, they don't respond appropriately to their conspecific vocalizations, um, and they have sort of abnormal reciprocal behaviors with their peers. Um, and so what we did is we said, okay, we have these characterized monkeys, and so can we look for molecules that are either involved in pro-social mammalian functioning or that have been implicated in autism in some ways? And so we looked at the um, oxytocin and vasopressin, which are two of my restricted interests, which are the sort of social, um, social, they're the sort of social neuropeptides, and then two kinase signaling pathways. And what we were able to say is by just knowing CSF vasopressin level alone, we could predict with high accuracy whether animals were high or low social and functioning. We replicated this in an independent monkey cohort. And what I want to point out is these were differences in cerebral spinal fluid, which is the fluid that bathes the brain, but we didn't see these differences in blood. And then what we did is um, any good myomarker should, if we measure it repeatedly in an individual, we should see the same level. And we had an error class correlation coefficient of 0.78, which was pretty good in four monkeys that we spinal tapped four times. And then, so what we said is, can we translate this to people, right? That's where it's really going to matter. And so um, I call cerebral spinal fluid liquid gold. I joke that the stuff in my freezer has four locks on it. And so um, Antonio, I think, calls my efforts dedicated. And I think that's clinical speak for relentless and probably bordering on the pathological. And I was, I was really determined to get this study done. And so what we were able to do is people aren't lumbar puncturing kids. And so what we were able to do was piggyback onto clinical indications. So kids who are getting lumbar punctures for standard of care reasons, which required us to get buy-in from people on every single pediatric service and clinic at Stanford, which we, which we did together. And that was really exciting. So we put hot pink stickers on lumbar puncture trays in the ER, right? And so it was actually a pretty fun study to do. And so um, anyway, what we were able to do in an initially very small sample size was predict, again, with pretty high accuracy, only knowing CSF vasopressin level, um, whether a kid was um, diagnosed as autistic or not. And this past week, we've just published another study, and we replicated this in the largest pediatric, pediatric cohort to date of 72 children. Um, and importantly, the lower the CSF vasopressin level, the worse the symptom severity of these kids on a gold standard autism diagnostic um, test. Um, and then we're also pursuing currently, um, there's a bank samples from infants. Um, it's an epidemiological study. We're pursuing about 2,000 infants who've either gone on to get autism or not. And we have some very preliminary data to suggest that in infants of two months of age, we can already see these signaling deficits in kids that then five or six years later were diagnosed at the time of the study. Um, so I'm going to pass the baton over to Antonio now. Maybe. Karen did it mention that the, the way we were able to get the study done, the CSF study done, is that we had a research assistant that we didn't pay him enough 
so he had to live with his parents on campus. And as you know, LPs, they do happen in the middle of the night. So he used to be called and get the consent form in the middle of the night. Anyway, so we'll tell you a little bit about some clinical study that uh, we've done. The first thing we do in psychiatry in general is to look at blood levels. And unfortunately, we don't learn and we keep doing the same mistakes. The first thing we try to do is to look at vasopressin in blood levels. And this is the largest study looking at vasopressin in blood level individual with autism. And you can see there are no differences between individuals with autism, their siblings, and control. And also, we looked at the difference between male and females, and we didn't see any difference. However, we've learned that this looking at it from a superficial way is not enough. We dug a little bit more. And what we saw is that the level of vasopressin in blood correlated with performance on one of the uh, social tasks that's commonly available, which is the theory of mind task, which is the ability to guess what the other person, uh, person is thinking or uh, feeling. So that got us thinking, could we use vasopressin, which is available in all intensive care units because it's a vasopressor, it helps with the individual with heart failure. Can we consider using intranasal vasopressin for the treatment of individuals with autism? It's a very uh, exciting thought, but I started worrying, we started worrying about how we can implement that. The first thing we did actually, we looked at what's out there with regard to vasopressin. And vasopressin has been found in individuals who are typically developing adults and individuals with post-stroke uh, aphasia and individuals who have diabetes insipidus. They've so there have been studies shown that it helps with social uh, information, it helps with memory of words, and also it helps with cooperative behavior. So that's why we decided why not we don't go for a clinical trial that looks at vasopressin in individuals with autism. And then my anxiety, our anxiety started increasing. <laughs> because imagine vasopressin, first drug, going to be used in kids. I was worrying about the FDA, how we're going to how are going to respond to us. So this is the, the grant. We submitted the grant. The first thing we do when you have a small pilot looking at a new compound, you focus on safety. So that's our first aim. The second aim, trying to look at its effectiveness regarding different social domain. And we submitted the grant. We got funded. And we submitted the application to the FDA. And we got a, a lot of comments. And here we go, we started thinking how we're going to convince the FDA to allow us to do the study because they wanted us to do PK studies, they wanted us to do blood work and monitor routine blood work. So fortunately, it was a very good conversation. We had a few con communication with them and they were very receptive and they understood where we we're coming from. We were coming from, we were working with patients. The kids' age range was from 6 to 12. We cannot poke them at 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes, and all of the PK stuff that are required. So they were understanding, and we adjusted a little bit the study design to accommodate what they were interested in. And so these are the methods, simple stuff. So the study, uh, we included 30 individuals. We had very standard or gold standard characterization. We had two target dose, kids for between the age six and to nine. You know they. They got 24 international unit, uh, 12 international unit twice a day. And for kids 9 to 12, they received the 32 international units. And we definitely monitor drug safety and tolerability. And our primary outcome measure was the social response and the sale. It's a parent questionnaire that will describe the social abilities of the kids. And this is a little bit the trial. We started with about 149 participants, 68 uh, participant enrolled in the study. 11 participants decided not to participate in the study when they heard about how many blood, works we, blood work we're doing. And 27 were found not to be eligible, and 30 were finally randomized. 17 went to the active group, and 13 went to the placebo group. And the age range, uh, as I mentioned, is 6 to 12. There was no difference in the age range. And the, when you look at the severity, they were kind of comparable between the two groups. Now let's look at the primary aim, which is safety. Fortunately, we didn't have any major incident. And you know, I saw most of these individuals because I was very anxious about this trial. Is it safe? How safe it is? 
Fortunately, we had no major adverse events. And if you look at the findings, you compare the uh, active group compared to the placebo group, none of these side effects uh, met uh, rich statistical significance. Also, we looked at blood, EKG, uh, chemistry, and fortunately, we didn't see any difference. So that was very reassuring because we were already thinking about the next step. Now, let's look at vasopressin efficacy. The primary outcome measure was the social response in the scale. And to my surprise, it was positive. So um, Karen didn't mention to you that she's optimist about, she's very optimistic about vasopressin and she believes that all world problems could be solved with a little bit more of vasopressin. I'm the skeptic here, which is, you know, we've been burned, we've been op optimistic about several uh, compounds in the past and every time we get burned. So here we're looking at differences between baseline and uh, the end of the trial. Unfortunately, there was a separation between the active compound and the placebo. So that's based on parent measures. But parents are biased, and we've learned that also the hard way over the years, especially in trials of individuals with autism. So we wanted to look at something a little bit more objective, which is the um, investigator's perspective, and we use the clinical global impression. And here what we noticed is that based on the investigator's impression, from information from the parents and the scale, we notice that there is an improvement in the active group compared to the placebo. And all of this, remember, this is double-blind randomized control style. Uh, now, we, we looked at parent questionnaire, we looked at measures by the investigator, but also we looked at objective measures. And the two measures that we used, which is the reading the mind in the eyes, which is basically you can see the eyes of an individual and the participant will have to tell you what the person is thinking or feeling. And the other task that we looked at is affect recognition task. And surprisingly, we saw also a nice signal in these two uh, uh, tests. So in summary, first is that the monkey model that Karen discussed earlier, it can be used to refine and subsequently test uh, hypothesis-driven approaches. And I was wondering, thinking about it as I was reviewing this, maybe you should try to see if you can treat individuals, like the, the uh, monkeys with low social ability, to treat them with vasopressin to see if We're they would. We're doing it right now. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. The other one is transgenerous, uh, is vasopressin signaling may be impaired in individuals with autism and, and uh, in uh, monkeys who are poor socially, and also CSF uh, vasopressin may be an indicator of the uh, uh, functioning ability, social functioning abilities, and in autism. And the last thing is that vasopressin treatment for autism is a promising lead based on the data that we uh, presented. However, as you all know, one trial is not enough. That's why we decided to do a follow-up trial, and now we have funding to look at uh, uh, about 100 kids with autism, and we're using a sequential parallel comparison design because we are trying to outsmart the signal or the problem that we uh, had in the small pilot study, which is the placebo response and the duration. And finally, uh, we want to mention something about the effort of all of you here, that sometimes philanthropy is the best way to start, and that's how we were able to get here. So we get some donation from the Simons Foundation based on a grant that we submitted, and then we got funding from the Child Health in, uh, Research Institute here at Stanford, and the Stanford BioX also from uh, private donors to get us to a point where we can submit a grant to NIH where they can be funding uh, us. And as you all know, NIH is risk averse, so that's why we wouldn't be here without support of philanthropy. And on that, uh, we'll end, and we, ask, we thank you for your attention. Okay.